this webinar sponsored by the Workflow 4.0 e-newsletter and ClearEdge 3D. Our webinar topic today is Best Practice BIMS, Tips, Tactics, and New Tools to Ensure Successful Projects. Hi, my name is Kevin Corbley, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Workflow 4.0. That's the newsletter of 3D scanning, modeling, documentation, ideas, and opinions. First, let me start by thanking you, our attendees, for joining us today. We know this topic is of tremendous interest because this is uh, one of our biggest webinars ever. We've got close to 500 people registered, and uh, everyone's here to, to learn more about the best practices in BIMS. And we know you'll be pleased with what you learn in the next hour. Let's take a quick look at the agenda today. Uh, we have uh, two professionals from the scanning and modeling industry who will be relating their experiences in, uh, in recent BIM projects. Uh, first, we've got Greg Hale. He'll be discussing a large chemical plant project that involved modeling both pipes and structure. And then we'll hear from Larry Klemper, uh, Klein -Klem uh, Kemper on an architectural BIM for a final build-out project. And then Kevin Williams from ClearEdge 3D will join us to tell us what's new in the latest release of Edgewise BIM Suite. And as always, we'll wrap up by letting you in the audience send in your questions to our panel of experts. A couple of quick housekeeping notes here. Uh, everyone in the uh, audience will be muted during the uh, session except for the presenters, of course. And uh, But you can ask questions via the uh, question box. Um, and you can do that any time during the session, but we will hold all the questions till the end, uh, the, uh, the live Q&A session. And the webinar is being recorded, and you'll each receive a link afterwards so you can go back and listen again. And uh, also, just a reminder to subscribe to the Workflow 4.0 newsletter. That's the one I just told you about. A lot of good stuff in there uh, in each issue. And let's have the introductions here. Um, I want to introduce our panelists. Greg Hale is the CTO of Hale Technology and Practice, or Hale TIP, uh, which he uh, just founded earlier this year. And Greg specializes in Revit, Navisworks, scanning, and mobile technology. And his experience spans construction management, engineering, and architecture fields. And Larry Kleinkemper is CTO of Landmar Services, which he also founded back in uh, 2007. Larry's a licensed architect with 20 years of computer modeling experience. And many of you already know Kevin Williams. He's the chief scientist for ClearEdge 3D and another founder. He founded uh, the company in 2007. Gentlemen, happy to have you all with us today. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. All right. And before we get started, let's take a quick look at today's goals. Um, you're going to learn a lot today. And here are the key takeaways. Um, you'll see how Hale, Tip, and Landmark pull off their as-built BIM projects to make sure everyone's happy with the results. And uh, Greg and Larry will show us how they integrate the latest tools and technologies into their deliverables. And you'll also find out how you can speed up uh, the as-built BIM workflow. And we think you're going to walk away with lessons learned that you can apply in your next project. All right, and that brings us to the first case study. And I'm going to ask uh, Greg to uh, come on. He's going to talk about this large chemical plant project with pipes and structure. And I'm going to hand the keyboard and the mouse over to you, Greg. All right. Thank you, Kevin. There so you just, go. Uh, well, just quickly about the, uh, the company I founded here in 2014. Um, I've been in the, the practice or the design and construction fields for about 15 years. Uh, originally starting out with a structural steel fabricator and erector doing con construction management, transferring over to some structural engineering for about six years and getting a structural engineering license. And then uh, as BIM or building information modeling began to take hold, really started to, to head up design technology and that branched out into a whole host of other things, including laser scanning, which we'll talk about today. And of course, that all those roads have uh, eventually led me to, to founding a company of my own here. So focus on technology consulting for architects and engineers, um, as well as builders. All these industries tend to have a lot of overlap with their, uh, their structures. Um, and in order to, to supply what they need, uh, basically have focused in on the Autodesk products, mainly being Revit as a, the primary tool. Navisworks is an extension of that for coordination. 
And of course, like I mentioned, this is branched out into things like laser scanning and mobile technology. So how do you leverage things like iPads and phones out in the field to, uh, to really gain some advantages on your site? And then kind of last but not least, uh, people tend to like the fact that I don't just preach these things, that I actually lead by example, as, as opposed to just telling them what they should do, I actually show them what they should do first um, so they have a, a true example and proof that the methods that I'm teaching and preaching are going to be effective for them. Okay. Make sure we can advance the slide here. So the case study we're going to talk about, um, as far as my, my project goes, uh, was a chemical processing plant. Um, it was a bit interesting because there was a, a series of different scopes of work that they were going after, all in conjunction under the same time track. Um, one of them was to document an existing building shell. Uh, it was an early, uh, originally an early 1920s building. And has kind of evolved over the years, as you see it in manufacturing plants, that, that these things tend to evolve almost daily um, for what they, they encompass uh, different processes. <clears throat> um, they also were looking to document a series of uh, pipe racks and structure along the site because they were doing a, a complete boiler replacement. Um, so if some of the site was being demolished, other pieces of it were going to remain. They need to know what was there in order to accommodate new additions to that piping and structure. So with that building facade, uh, they particularly wanted to focus in on the parapets. They wanted to know, OK, what spots are failing? What spots are kind of out of plumb? What spots uh, need repointing, repointing? And where do we need to, to focus our work at? And uh, all these things are a bit hard to field measure. So laser scanning was a perfect uh, tool for that. Uh, as mentioned, that existing boiler was being replaced and the structural racks. Overall, between the building and the structure and pipe racks, that uh, overall square footage was about 120,000 square feet. So it was fairly spread out across a couple of parts of their site. Now, when you're scanning areas like this, um, it's not always cut and dry as far as where you can place a scanner, where you're going to get good line of sight. And so we had thought we would have some good advantages to go out, uh, scan on top of some platforms, on top of some equipment. But we quickly found that at times that vibration could be an issue, at other times it works. And I would say probably about 50% of the time the scans worked. And of course, they still had to be checked for their accuracy. And with the, the different scanners, uh, they have instrumentation in that helps compensate for that. However, it doesn't always work. So you can kind of count on throwing away some scans or, or checking them each half day or each full day uh, to make sure that you got what you got and maybe have to go back to an additional spot or an adjacent location where you're not getting quite as much vibration. Uh, we also had to deal with you know, chemical plant site. These things are 24-7 operations. Uh, they're rarely 8 to 5 operations. So there's always something going on. It's very difficult to shut down an area because they have a product to deliver. And they can't just say, OK, we're going to stop production so we can get some existing documentation. So with that, you know, there were times when trucks would pull in. Uh, they had some, some areas that had to be roped off that we couldn't access. We either had to take breaks or go do some, some modeling or some registration at that time. And those kinds of things are very hard to count on when you're estimating a project. Um, the client always kind of wants to cut down that cost and make it minimal. But you always have to keep a little bit of fluff in there to, to account for these um, these occurrences. And certainly in a, a chemical kind of plant, with, with a mix of building study, structural work, and piping, it's a, a series of different disciplines. And so it's kind of hard to be a, a disciplinary specialist, a mechanical engineer or a structural engineer, you know, maybe an, an architect, um, you know, those kinds of things. There's really a, a mix of use of the job. So it had a it was a good example of having a multidisciplinary background uh, and being able to understand what they were going to use as part of it. And another interesting thing here was that the deliverable was required in Revit. And this is really why I was initially contacted on the project, tending to be a Revit expert. Uh, they had a series of buildings on the site that were delivered in Revit. And they really liked that workflow, that, that building information modeling technology, and wanted to see it used kind of throughout the rest of the project. So they said, OK, what can we do to leverage this 
as part of this laser scanning process and turn it into some more usable data. So for the project, we took uh, 65 scans. Those scans took about two and a half days. Uh, with the resolution that we set in the scanner, uh, each of those scans took about 15 minutes. And you have to account for some setup and teardown time, uh, as well as kind of maneuvering through some of these buildings, uh, as well as the structure. So if you've ever taken a scanner before, there are some scanners that are 30, 40 pounds. Um, and you're lugging this thing around. If you have to go up on top of a scaffold or a ladder or a piece of equipment or even up to a roof, you're often climbing ladders. So you need, you need to have a piece of equipment that's mobile enough to get access to these areas. Pharaoh's lighter scanner tend to be ideal for the situation as far as its mobility. You basically take the scanner, put it in a backpack, climb up the ladder, do a setup, and continue on with the work. <coughs> um, so as I mentioned, we, we use the Ferro Focus 3D. Uh, quite honestly, I would have liked to get my hands on one of the new Ferro Focus X330s, um, but didn't have it available at that particular time. Uh, it would have been a little bit better in the range. But overall, it performed. Uh, I would say admirably for the project. It did, it did a good job. So after uh, the two and a half days of scanning, <clears throat> it took about a day to process that data to register it, make sure it was all clean and accurate and there weren't any discrepancies. And as mentioned before, at times we had to throw out some of those scans, uh, pull in some additional ones or adjacent ones. Uh, I had to get rid of those ones with the, the vibration. We also found with that particular scanner is a little bit older technology and you do get a little bit more noise in there. Luckily, the software we were dealing with did a great job with recognizing some of that and working around it. So as far as modeling workflow, you know, once we had those scans registered um, in Ferro scene, uh, we basically took those out and we uh, brought them into the Autodesk Recap. So if you're not familiar with Recap, uh, it's a relatively new tool from Autodesk. It serves as an intermediary tool to get it into things like Revit, Navisworks, and AutoCAD. So we were able to, to look at that and import it into those other programs. But we also needed to do a lot of feature extraction. So we needed to get the pipes, we needed to get the structure, and we needed to get some of the buildings. So we took the tools from uh, ClearEdge, the Edgewise uh, plant or the Edge, Edgewise uh, Revit suite, and extracted these features. And you can see some of these slides here. You can see uh, the building in the, the top right-hand corner there. Basically, what it takes is it looks for the planes in the, the laser scan and identifies those. And from those, you can build your wall geometry from it. So it's a great place to start. Pipes are an even uh, better workflow. If you've ever had to work with a laser scan and more or less trace the pipe in a model, it can be extremely time consuming. As well, um, it's quite boring work. Uh, you're going through, you're taking small sections of the scan, and you're basically drafting over the laser scan pipe by pipe. Well, what EdgeWise does is it goes through and uses algorithms through the software and extracts 70, 80, 85 percent of those pipes automatically for you, and the rest is, is a cleanup process. So it really gives you a bump in time as far as that modeling. Um, as well, um, there's a QC process, which I'll talk about in a second. So all of this work really only required one modeler. We didn't require necessarily a team of it, uh, a team of modelers. It wasn't extraordinarily difficult modeling, um, so we didn't necessarily need to have an industry specialist. But you will find certain situations where it's going to be uh, extremely helpful to have one. So with this, uh, just a couple more examples on the Clear Edge uh, Edgewise products is, for example, structure there in the top right-hand corner. You can see it's basically using that laser scan, extracting from a, a database to find your structural member, and, and placing that in the model for you. Uh, as mentioned before, when you're going through and you're doing this by hand, you're interpreting with that laser scan, and you're trying to come up with your best fit as best you know how. And sometimes these things are askew, out of plumb, out of level. And so it's all based upon your interpretation. What ClearEdge as EdgeWise does is uses those algorithms to find that best fit based upon the data that you're providing it. So what it does is provides that quality control for you to get that best fit documentation. And then with piping, you can also uh, with piping and you can also apply 
typical standards. So for steel, it would be AISC standards in the U.S. For, for piping, you'd dig into the, uh, the piping standards databases and you'd pull out the standard pipe sizes. So you're going through that entire process as, a com as opposed to coming up with odd sizes, odd shapes, and trying to come up with your, your human-led best fit. And then to top it off, the nice thing with this is since we were looking at a Revit deliverable, Edgewise provides those native Revit objects as part of the process. So that's a huge step for us. And then just a, a couple of uh, tips and tactics, tactics to top this off. Um, as mentioned before, account for that extra time in the field. So those things like throwaway scans, like I said, vibration tends to be there. Uh, in some cases, bright sunlight can kind of screw up a scan or really screw up your, your color values if you're taking color imagery. Um, it is best, the best idea to take a control survey as part of the registration process. It's really going to help clean up any registration errors or over long distances. It's going to help you avoid any of that drift. If at all possible, if you can't get a control survey, at the very least, find a way to, to close the loop. More or less, scan in a I'll call it a circular pattern, so that you begin or you end where you begin. The last scan ties in with the first scan, and that tends to remove a lot of the drift that can be inherent in a laser scan process. Use a feature extraction software. Of course, like I showed you, Clear Edge, Edgewise products, they're going to speed up that process for you, allow you to cut some of that fee out of the project, and of course, make it more attractive to the, the eventual client. Um, never scan, never move the scan data when importing to Revit. So we'll talk a, a few about a few more tips um, with Revit towards the end of the, the session here. But what you'll find is when you export data from one program to another to another, once you start moving that data, if you have at any point in time have to come back and replace scans or add additional scans, if you move that data, now you're kind of stuck with manually aligning it to previous scans. So once you bring it into things like Revit or any other program, you do not want to, to move that. Um, it is also helpful that some of these projects come out with True North, and so that's not a typical approval. So we'll often rotate that project north. What you want to be aware of is if you rotate a project north in Revit, you'll want to bring in any additional scans by their shared coordinates, and that will pull in the coordinate system from those laser scans and place them appropriately. So it's kind of a, a little known fact, but you want to make sure that you do that. It's still never moving the scan within Revit. So with that, I believe that wraps up my portion of it. Oh, oh one more, a couple more tactics here, sorry. Um, use targets for registration and outdoor conditions for higher accuracy. But we've seen some, uh, some new products come out that are targetless registration for scanning. Um, I would say they're very close to being right on. Um, but I do find that we get less accuracy if we're using targetless registration. So for outdoor scanning, still highly recommend using target registration. Um, send the modelers on site to understand the scanning resolutions and positioning. Even though there are things like TrueScan and uh, Fero WebShare providing photography, um, providing field measurements that you can pull directly from the laser scan. Nothing can compare to being on the site and actually seeing it and helping a scanner provide the appropriate data for what you need to model. It's basically an invaluable process. Uh, one other little trick here, when you're translating or when you're extracting uh, geometry from these files, you want to start off with a company template that has all of your standards built in. And it's helpful if you're a multidisciplinary firm to have standards from each of the disciplines built into that one template. So if you're pulling structure and you're pulling piping and you're pulling architecture from those objects, it's most beneficial to, to have those objects within that same template. It doesn't mean you can't pull them in later, but it's helpful to have them from the get-go. So most firms don't have that all-encompassing template. It may help you to build this uh, or pull this together before you start pulling in uh, laser scan extraction. All right, so that wraps up for me. Back to you, Kevin. All right, great. Hey, Greg, that uh, that sounded like a uh, really uh, a great 
uh, discussion on a complex project, and as I was listening to you, I was just wondering, I mean, you know, where did this fall in the difficulty scale? Are, are most of your projects this complex, or, uh, you know, uh, or was this, was this an easier one or one of the harder ones? Uh, quite honestly, it was one of the easier ones. <clears throat> um, they do tend to get more complex in some things like historical preservation or older buildings when you get into some of the 1800s buildings, which we see quite often up here in the Northeast. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to uh, move forward and appreciate that, Greg. And uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Larry, and he's going to start with his part of the presentation. Larry, take it away. Thanks, Kevin. And, uh, man, Greg, that was, uh, that was a lot of great information. Uh, you didn't leave me much to talk about. You took all the best suggestions, but I'll try to work my way through uh, so, Landmark, just for those of you who don't know us, uh, we're a shop uh, that, that model from point clouds uh, for different scan providers. Uh, we were founded in 2007, and uh, we work all over North America. Uh, we do computer modeling for architecture and engineering, as, uh, especially also I'd like to mention surveyors uh, uh, call us a lot. and. Uh, and we work in multiple modeling uh, software packages. Um, uh, we are headquartered in Austin, Texas, where it's a beautiful day. It's 95 in the shade and 110 degrees on the asphalt. So with that, let's begin. Uh, for some reason, my next didn't want to do it. So. Uh, yeah, we've done a number of skyscrapers. Uh, some of them are high profile. Um, modeling tenant final, uh, for their final build out or uh, finish out. Um, uh, we've worked on buildings such as the Empire State Building, 30 Rockefeller Plaza, or 30 Rock if you prefer, and uh, the Sears Tower or Willis Tower, if you, it's now called in the World Trade Center. And they all have sort of common uh, uh, um, challenges, and their challenges are uh, sort of you know working with unique skyscrapers. Uh, oh, sorry, working with skyscrapers, they have a lot of extra piping and structure servicing the hundred plus floors uh, that are above or below, and uh, trying to find all that pipe and structure and model it out uh, can be a challenge. It's also you're working with extremely high dollar per square foot rents, and so there's a high scrutiny of the work. As far as you know, uh, a lot of people are applying your model towards BOMA cop calculations and uh, figuring out exactly where the glass is or where structure is uh, becomes extremely important. And with all these buildings, uh, building access can be uh, very limited. So it's extremely important to schedule out um, when you're going to be there, how long you're going to be there, and who's going to let you in. Uh, otherwise, you can end up waiting in the lobby for hours and not actually make it onto the site that day. So the important thing to talk about uh, as far as field collection and workflow, uh, when we are hiring the scan provider, um, we are always sending one scan tech and one lead modeler. And when the scan providers hire us, we, we try to insist that on nearly every project, we send the lead modeler out to the site. We found that uh, the biggest mistakes and silliest mistakes we ever make is when the modeler doesn't go to the site and um, uh, they misinterpret the point clouds. It's very easy to do. Um, but if you walk the site, it's amazing what your brain and eyes catch. Uh, and when you get back to the office, the point cloud makes perfect sense and is very easy to interpret. And uh, the modeling goes in, uh, probably about twice as fast. Um, if we don't send the modeler to the site, it is uh, We'll spend twice as long trying to figure out silly things like odd-shaped columns that later on we realize are actually trash cans. So very important 
both Scantech and the model are sending them to the site. I believe Greg said the same sort of thing. I think it's also uh, important that they work together. Um, the uh, setting, setting up the scanning equipment and targets uh, where they're using targets. A lot of people are going to target lists, and that's cool. Uh, I think for large buildings, it's still important to have a few targets that you maintain control, and uh, running control is is imperative. Uh, the modeler and the the scan tech will often work together uh, to sort of come up with a decent scanning path, and also uh, doing the full loop, like Greg had suggested, I think is a great idea. And then talking about resolutions, it's important uh, that scan tech understands where uh, where they need high resolution scanning and where they can turn the scanning down in order to get an efficient point cloud. Uh, it helps them speed up the registration process and it'll help the modelers uh, later on not having something that's scanned all at a high resolution or all at a low resolution or a medium resolution where it's it's going to miss things and it may cause the computer to run slower. So making that point cloud as efficient as possible uh, at that stage. And then while the scan tech uh, keeps that scanner moving because time on site is precious, uh, the modeler should be looking for details, shadows, and potential artifact issues. So if like they're going to have to do BOMA calculations and they're measuring to the window. Well, scanners have difficulty, we all know, with picking up glass. And so uh, the modeler should be there uh, paying particular attention to how that window is put together and where the glass plane actually is. And uh, looking for other little detail issues that could very easily get missed by the scanner uh, or uh, fall into a shadow. And then at the end of the day, uh, photo keys and scan maps are crucial to everybody. It's really important. Um, it's what I find is the way right before you leave the site, um, if there's a place where you can stop for a coffee and sit down and go through and make sure that you mark out where all your photos were taken or where all your scans were taken, it gives you an opportunity right then and there to say, this is what I've missed. It, uh, if you draw it out right then and there, uh, there's a good chance you'll see something that you might have missed rather than getting all the way back to the office and then uh, uh, potentially happen to take another trip or, or having you know a blind spot. Thank you. So uh, field collection workflow, um, which scanner? And when it comes to that, I, I really say it depends on the specs. So the, the type of job you're doing and whether the scanner specs are important. Which manufacturer? Uh, I know they all cheer, we're the best, we're the best, but to be honest, I have found that the, the scanning manufacturer is nowhere near as important as the scanning tech. Um, a tech that knows their machine and what it can and can't do, uh, knows how to scan and register, makes the biggest difference of all, way more than which machine you actually have. Uh, they all do a pretty darn good job at what they say they do, and um, uh, they're all pretty good instruments. We end up working with all of them. We've worked with Leica, uh, Faro, uh, ZNF, and others, and, and they all pretty much have it down. Um, the differences are in their specifications, and some do perform better at one job or another. Uh, scanning in color, in our opinion, is for marketing. Uh, very little in modeling. In fact, it'll cause more troubles at times than um, than it's worth. It makes the scanners, it makes the scan point clouds uh, heavier and slower on the computer. Um, the only place where we do find them useful from time to time is when you've got a heavily populated pipe area and you're trying to tell one pipe type from another. 
In that situation, scanning in color can be useful, but in all other situations, it ends up being more of a hindrance. Um, we'd already talked about the idea of scanning in different resolutions. Um, scanning where there's little pipes, you need to turn the resolution up and understand uh, what your scanner is going to be able to pick up and what it won't. And then understand also that the modeling packages are going to auto decimate your cloud. So what you're going to see in Revit and AutoCAD is going to be less than what you're going to see in your registration packages. So in modeling, many people ask us how we do it. Um, we have a team of modelers. Each takes on specific parts of the model. Uh, one person may be tackling, or a couple people may be tackling architectural, while another person tackles structural, and another person tackles piping, etc. cetera. Uh, Eighty percent of what we're being asked for to produce is Revit. Um, there's still 10% of the people out there that want 3D AutoCAD or Civil 3D. Um, 5% are wanting uh, 3D Studio Max for rendering and animations. Uh, uh, more is starting to come in from film uh, requests as opposed to architectural and engineering. And then 5% is other things like MicroStation. We do find auto extraction tools like Edgewise, MEP, and Structural are worth their weight in gold. Um, totally worth their money. They don't get 100%, and I'm sure if you asked any one of them, they would agree with me. Um, it's, but because of shadows and uh, one pipe include, uh, creating an inclusion over the other, um, there's going to be some little misses. But for the most part, what it does capture uh, totally pays for itself. And so uh, we do find them very useful in uh, speeding up our timelines and getting projects done faster. And the piping and structural are by far the two most complicated parts of any modeling project. Uh, we receive all types of point clouds. Um, I, I don't find that one type is uh, superior to the other um, in, in many meaningful ways. Uh, they all translate into points and, and are useful, whether they're on the Faro side, FLS, FWS, or the Leica side, PTC or PTX. Uh, we, we, we've worked with them all and they all seem to work just fine. Uh, TrueView is uh, one of our favorite um, packages to sort of view point clouds. On the as we're going through, we always hit a point where the point cloud looks a little. Uh, it may be a little confusing, and being able to pop in true view and take a look or scene, and take a look um, at where you know from the scanning position, uh, the point clouds become almost immediately apparent as far as what we're trying to uh, figure out. And then the final deliverable, almost 100% the of the reason why people contact us is that you know there's an architect or an engineer who they either can't understand or don't have a computer strong enough to handle point clouds. And so they always need um, uh, some sort of computer model as a deliverable. Um, uh, we provide mechanical, electrical, and plumbing models uh, complete structural, and then uh, architectural, we've gone down to the molding. Uh, it's just basically everything. So as built tips and tactics, um, uh, scanning techs need to know their resolution and distance. I really uh, think the the best thing you can do for yourself is to uh, a daytime scan and a nighttime scan in a empty parking lot where you can measure out exactly you know uh, some distances and place some pipes out in the field and understand how far away you can get before you can't capture a one inch pipe or a four inch pipe and um, uh, 
and also testing out your resolutions with different size pipes and uh, not just in your registration software, it's extremely important to take it into the modeling software because if people aren't modeling with your point clouds, uh, for the most part, it's, you know, that's, it's almost use, useless um, unless you're doing Navisworks. Uh, okay, and then modelers, uh, you've got to go to the site. Um, and I guess this isn't so much for the modelers, but managers of modelers, you got to let your people go, go to the site uh, and see it. They'll model in half the time, and it'll be well worth the travel expense. Uh, they'll also make far fewer silly mistakes. Um, when you walk the site, things are obvious. When you're just looking at a point cloud and you've never been to the site, it's very easy to make silly mistakes and, uh, and not realize uh, what some little boxes are. And then hire a diverse team of specialists is my suggestion. Uh, it, if you just hire people like yourself or just architecture or just structural or just survey curve and try to get them to model everything, uh, it, it, it tends, to, tends to have big holes. Um, I find that uh, by letting your team specialize and hiring people that specialize in different areas, uh, it gives you a much di more diverse group and uh, your models end up coming, uh, having a more finished look to them. And then use uh, extraction software to speed up workflows. Uh, it, they're, they're well worth their money. And uh, it'll give you a big jump start on the project and help you find a lot of things. A number of times it'll find a lot more pipes than, than you ever will manually. And then uh, this is one of the biggest tips that I can give anybody is uh, as you go through, you should flip your background occasionally from light, uh, white to black or light to dark. Um, uh, try different backgrounds. Uh, with a lot of the scan data coming into things like Revit, um, and it's a grayscale, but uh, you'll see on different backgrounds, uh, different objects will pop. Uh, we had one worker here who thought that I just used a black background most of the time because uh, that's what old people do. And uh, uh, then she was modeling a site and uh, and she was having a real tough time seeing things uh, with her white background, seeing things like sidewalks and um, uh, a number of features that were lightly painted. And once I flipped it over to the back, the black background for her, those features jumped out and were extremely readable. And it goes the same way, uh, the opposite direction. A lot of things, if they're painted dark, painted uh, black, or what have you, they'll be harder to see in the on the black background in your screen. Um, and so occasionally if you flip it over to the light side to the like a white background, uh, those those features will just jump out of the point cloud at you. Uh, take the model one section at a time. Uh, using section boxes, I almost entirely live in the 3D viewer and uh, with section box turned on and off. And then you just, the fastest way and easiest way to get to modeling is to break it down into small pieces that you can easily understand and quickly get to. 2D thin sections and 3D orient to view are extremely useful as well in helping you define and, and understand your point clouds. And then coordinating the levels before you uh, extract and import, start importing walls. Uh, I think is really important. Uh, getting your levels set up and and locked into place and then linking the point clouds uh, into Revit, origin to origin or sh shared coordinates. Um, once you've got them in, pin them and never move them. And that's, um, I can't tell you, I've seen people, the sort of the, the mark of a, a beginner is, you know, they'll draw a wall in place and then they'll try to move the point cloud to match a straight wall um, as they're zooming around. 
and uh, and before you know it, they've got point clouds that don't match up to other point clouds. And uh, I, I always give them at least one warning before I fire them over that. So don't don't allow that to happen. Pin it into place. Make sure people know that they they're never to move it. Because if at any point uh, another point cloud needs to be brought in and placed with that existing cloud, or you get something that corrupts, um, it it really becomes a nightmare. And then uh, disable the selection of links and pins. Uh, I think this is something that that uh, Craig's talked about or or suggested. Um, I think that that's also probably the best best way of keeping your young staff out of trouble. I like to use camera views and Navisworks uh, walkthroughs and flythroughs to visually check the model before handing it back or uh, delivering it. Um, I found that when you think that you're totally done, uh, the best thing you can do, or if you get all from one of your uh, modelers, uh, before you you say it's done and hand it out, is I like to drag cameras into the Revit model and sort of move around and walk through. And when you have that point cloud overlaid with the model, things will immediately start popping out. Uh, camera view is very difficult to work in, but it's a great inspection mode. And Nevisworks is too. Whoops. Okay. Terrific. Hey, Larry, that was uh, that was a really uh, interesting presentation with a lot of great tips for both, uh, as you said, the beginners, but uh, the the veterans or, or the old guys uh, as well. So, um, <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, and uh, you're welcome, and thank you. And and before I uh, bring Kevin Williams on, just a quick uh, reminder to the audience: we are getting questions already, so please feel free to start sending those in while they're still fresh in your minds. Um, we're going to go through them in just a couple minutes during the Q&A, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. But the queue is uh, already got uh, several questions in it. So uh, next, what I would like to do is um, I'm going to ask uh, Kevin Williams to come on and give us a sneak peek at what's coming up this fall in the Edgewise uh, BIM suite. Kevin? Sure. Thank you, Kevin Corbley. Um, yeah, I, I'm really pretty excited about what we're working on these days for the for this upcoming release. Um, the the probably the single biggest thing is square ducting. We've had a, a a lot of people ask us for new tools to be able to work with square ducts, um, and so we've been working on that. Um, and we've we've already got kind of prototype tools for extracting straight pieces of ducting, uh, modeling the bends modeling the, the transitions from size to size, and then exporting that to, to Revit. So um, I'm anticipating a, a, a limited initial beta version coming out fairly shortly. Um, and it's, it's, it's looking really good. It's looking like a very, very powerful new tool that we'll be able to offer here. Um, one of the other other biggies that, that will be in this, this next release is some, some substantial visualization improvements. We're going to be improving the point cloud rendering engine, um, speeding that up, making it more responsive, um, and giving giving better perspective views of the point cloud. Um, we're also improving our scanner view to, to make it much more like a true view or, or bubble view type of experience um, and, and really clean that up and make it a really nice experience to go through and look at your look at your point cloud. Um, and then we we are also going to to uh, vastly improve our tools for clipping and slicing the point cloud, so that you can go through and and look at exactly the section of the point cloud that you want to, exactly the section of your physical model that you're that you're trying to create, um, and get get much better perspective on on what you're trying to do. We're expanding our steel libraries. Uh, we've we've got Canadian, uh, European. Uh, a UK specific spec, um, and we're working on several others as well. Um, and we've got a, a a new tool for exporting ground surface models to Revit and bringing those in. 
Um, and then uh, a, a number of other smaller, smaller but really quite nice features. So it, sh it should be should be a, a pretty substantial release coming up soon, and uh, I, I'm I'm looking forward to to getting some feedback on it. All right, that's great, and that's going to uh, wrap up the presentation part of today's webinar. And we are going to go ahead and move into the Q&A session. So I'll ask uh, the panel to uh, unmute yourselves. And we're going to dive right into some questions here. And uh, Kevin, this may be a first. We actually got a question for you before you even started talking. So I'm not sure how that happened. Um, but uh, let, me, let me pick one. Here, here's one that we got for you, Kevin. Do your deliverables include some kind of report that details the mathematical basis for accuracy? The act of interpreting a laser scan into geometry uh, uh, primitives yes. involves interpolation. So has there uh, ever been a legal issue over whether a model is accurate? Um, so yes, to to answer the first part of that question, yes, okay. there there is a a really nice detailed reporting mechanism inside the piping module. Uh, we're still building it out for the structural steel component, but the inside the piping module, there's a there's a phenomenal QA, QC, and reporting mechanism called our smart sheet, and that gives a detailed fit report for every single component um, in that in in your model. Um, it will give you the root mean squared error um, as well as a percent coverage um, and that that com as, as well as a um, there's a there's a checkoff box as you go through the QA process every single every single pipe gets gets annotated with whether it's been inspected or not. Um, very quick, very automated um, and it's it can be exported as a deliverable to a to a client. Okay, all right. Now, uh, I'm not aware of any legal issues, but I I, I know I know that it exists. Um, so I, I I don't know if any of our customers have had to supply any any legal proof or anything like that. But I I, I imagine you know it's 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 definitely there if you need it. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And, and just one more uh, follow-up for you, Kevin. How do you deal with components not visible to the scanner, such as pipes that go through walls or ducts? <laughs> uh, you take your best best guess at it. <laughs> um, there there are tools uh, with within Edgewise now uh, to it, just completely build components out of scratch. So you can if if there is no point cloud support for it, you can you can still build those components out and line them up with existing components and and it's 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 all pretty pretty nice and easy to use. It's the the main functionality of Edgewise, of course, is to extract from a point cloud um, what's actually observed in the point cloud. But the the there are tools to finish up because you you're, you're always going to miss five ten percent of what's actually out there just through occlusion. So there are tools inside of Edgewise to go through and create those objects man manually. Okay, great. And and this question I think is is for Larry cuz Larry I think you were the one who brought up the issue of the uh, yeah. the photos and uh, this says um, did you use extra photos for ex uh, external camera to improve your understanding of objects for modeling? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really just a different point of view. Um, and what I found was um, the photos were great for staff who didn't get to go. We usually only send the lead modeler. But uh, we also found that if a lead modeler takes photos, they're, and they're, they're out there trying to take photos of details, it forces them to look at the details. And uh, when they get back, they may not even ever look at the thousand photos. Uh, but they've got those images in their head and uh, it just, it, again, it speeds up the process. It gives them one more way to look at things that uh, it adds to having that point cloud background. Okay. All right. Great. All right. And uh, Greg, we have one for you. Um, can you use an isolation mat between the scanner feet and a platform to reduce the vibration? 
Mm, it's a good question. Um, I can't say that I've tried it, but I would highly doubt that that would work. Um, some of these pieces of equipment are more than noticeably vibrating, mm -hmm. and it, of course, it's uh, when you're estimating your app to begin with, there's really no way to tell what what pieces of equipment or what platforms are vibrating and which ones aren't. Um, some equipment is better isolated than others. Uh, like I said, we've got about a 50% success rate with scanning on on platforms or equipment that's vibrating. So you kind of plan on uh, plan on checking it and then um, throwing it out. And if all, if at all possible, you avoid those areas. And if if you can get something adjacent, um, the the nice thing about those is that perspective from above is always uh, I'm not gonna say always better but it adds a whole heck of a lot to the point cloud that you'll never get from the ground, and I can't wait to get aerial scanning where that's not an issue. Gotcha. Okay. And, and somebody wanted to know why you were using a phase-based scanner and not using a combination of phase-based and time of flight uh, in, in an open environment. Um, I guess it's all a matter of choice um, and understanding, uh, like Larry has kind of pointed out, the, the different applications if they're appropriate. Um, You'll kind of go back and forth between manufacturers and their scanners, um, whether it's time of flight or phase based and their accuracy. And you really have to to understand that scope of work. What's the what's the expected accuracy? What's the scope of the work that the client is is trying to accomplish with it? And everybody has a different perspective of it. Um, you know, I will yeah. say, if you want that higher higher accuracy, then you may want to choose a particular scanner over another. But you're also going to have a completely different cost. Yeah, it's, I mean, uh, just to add what Greg said, uh, if you have the availability to take both types out there, fantastic, you know, but it's it's a matter of, you know, how, how much uh, for each project, how much cost uh, a project can occur, and whether or not you have both scanners available to you. Um, both have different strengths, and um, uh, the lightweight, fast-moving focus um, is fantastic for a lot of jobs. The uh, heavier uh, scanners, um, time of flight, uh, they'll often give you much more precise measurements over a distance, and, and you may not have to do as many setups. So uh, both have, have real value and real strengths, um, but it, it's what can you carry with you when, at the end of the day, and how many people can you take with you? Yeah, great. Okay. And, and here's another question I think both of you might want to take a shot at. Larry, why don't you go first? Uh, how much time was spent in Edgewise cleaning up the false positives, uh, corrugation railings, et cetera? Yeah, that goes fairly quick. I mean, it, there definitely is some false positives. Um, uh, corrugated metal is, is a big uh, troublemaker at times. Um, but uh, again, the amount that we're able to find uh, when you've got a serious situation like, you know, Greg's chemical plant or, you know, we've done uh, some uh, other types of plants or even in a building where you've got, a, you know, a, a big mechanical room, uh, being able to auto find a lot of the pipe and then uh, uh, and get its near if not exact size uh, right away is is so much more it outweighs the 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 drawbacks of having a few false positives and the false positives you can get rid of fairly quickly uh, 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 in my experience okay I, I agree with everything everything you said Larry the false positives especially things like corrugated metal and railing they stand out like a sore thumb and you could just window those out really quick and it's really getting down to uh, when you start getting into the nitty-gritty pipes um, you know, that you may or may not have enough data to collect from the automatic feature extraction but that's that's a little bit more time consuming for the QC process but you know in general when you're dealing with two inch pipes and above you know it's really hitting up a, a vast majority of those pipes okay Great. Uh, Kevin Williams, here's a quick one for you. Which CAD outputs are positive with 3D Edgewise uh, in final model? Uh, which CAD outputs are po possible? Yeah. Um, 
we we can we can go directly into Revit, uh, AutoCAD, MicroStation, um, PDMS, and CADWorks, um, as well as the, we we have a COE plugin with Cyclone as well. Um, so we can we can go seamlessly into all of those those different applications. Um, and there's, there's workarounds to get into to other other software as well. Um, we're we're very close to having a Plant 3D um, uh, capability as well. Okay, great. And Greg, I think this one's for you. How much prep work is needed to get quality scans for MEP uh, running into hard ceilings and building elements? Uh, it could be a problem, I think. Yeah, that's definitely a pretty loaded question. Uh, you're kind of dealing with a, a, a pretty difficult scope of work when you have to start popping up about ceilings. I know um, you know, this group has had previous presentations on a similar kind of workflow for things like hospitals. Um, it's a bit different. You want to try to, to speed up the workflow, get access to those areas above ceilings uh, quickly and easily using things like telescoping tripods, um, using extra manpower to help remove ceiling tiles faster, you know, using a, a few different rigs. To get in there, I've used actually a two-by-two two piece of plywood uh, to stick up in a ceiling tile uh, and scan up there. And then, of course, you're, you've got to get line of sight. It's a, it's a pretty difficult process to get above ceilings, and it all depends upon that, that specific job. Okay. I don't know what else I can say yeah, about I, that. It's, it's definitely I, a difficult the, the only thing I... Yeah, the only thing I'd add to Greg's is uh, is if you can remote start your your scanner, uh, combining that with a telescoping tripod is the most effective use I've seen. Um, and having a heavy enough tripod that it doesn't shake when it's you know 12 feet up, uh, I think is pretty critical. Okay, great. And Larry, I'm, I believe this one is for you. It says to clarify. For engineering purposes, 80% of users would use Revit and 10% would use AutoCAD. Is that what you said? Yeah, it's what what we're finding is is that as firms make the change to Revit and they're suddenly drawing everything three-dimensionally, that's when 3D scanning suddenly becomes uh, much more efficient, economical uh, for them and for their process. Now there is still a small pers there's a much smaller percentage of people who are drawing three dimensionally in AutoCAD for one reason or another. Some mechanical, um, definitely in the civil and surveying world, they're using uh, still using 3D civil uh, over Revit. But uh, but I would say 90% of the requests coming into our office are for Revit deliverables um, around the country around North America. I want to include Canada and the Caribbean. Gotcha. Okay. All right. If I could uh, yeah. add to that just really quickly. Go ahead, Greg. Um, yeah. so I, like, I like to build laser scanning as the gateway drug into 3D. <laughs> there are a lot of yeah. firms out there that are, that are not quite up to speed on three-dimensional uh, products. And to have to, to inherit scan data and to be able to model from it is truly a, a gateway drug into 3D. And then something like the Edgewise platform just really turns it up a huge notch and makes it so much more feasible uh, for these firms who have kind of still been stuck in the 2D world. Okay, great. And, and Greg, another one for you. What methodology do you use to plan out your scan locations and the number of scans for a job? Do you, do you get a floor plan, for instance? Yeah, I, ideally if we can get a floor plan uh, plus photos from a client, um, we'll take those, I'll lay those out. I actually use Bluebeam Review uh, as a PDF tool. And it's just got a quick marker to, to count these up. And I'll, I'll do my best guess for uh, scan locations. So if I see things like deep window wells, I'll make sure that I, I've got a scan location in front of deep window wells. Or in the case of structure, uh, I've done a couple of structural failure jobs. You know, There might be four or five extra scans in a particular area. But more or less, it's a, a straight up estimate you're trying to get uh, predict those scan locations, lay them out, add them up, and then you know, multiply those uh, across the time, and then add a bit of a safety factor on there for, for throwing away some of those scans. Okay, terrific. 
And, uh, and we've got a lot of questions, so we're probably going to go about five minutes uh, over today. Um, I appreciate uh, everybody sticking with us. Um, Kevin, here's an interesting question for you. Will the ground surface model give a model of gravel piles, excavated areas, and give volumes? It, it actually will. Uh, um, and, and that's actually that, that type of, of, of ground surface model. I'm not sure you'd want to bring it into Revit, but that already exists right now in some of, in, and has existed in some of our previous versions of the software. Um, the new thing coming out is the ability to bring it into Revit. I, I suppose you could do that same type of analysis inside of Revit as well. Okay. But yes. Right. It, what, what it essentially does, I'm, I'm sorry, is, is uh, strips off the above ground features, like if there's equipment moving over the top of your dirt pile or gravel pile, it'll strip that off, get you down to the, the, the actual surface of the gravel pile, um, and from there you can do your calculations. Okay, great. And uh, Larry, can you link the scans into a Revit file and then link that file into a model file? Are you still there, Larry? Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were asking me. Sure. Uh, uh, can you ask the question again? Sure. Yeah. It says, "Can you link the scans into a Revit file and then link that file into a model file?" No. Uh, not really. What you want to do is link the scans directly into the file that you're looking at. Um, I. It's been a while since I've tried doing something like that. Um, I'm going to do the uh, linking the scans into one file and then linking that file into another file. Uh, it What it does is there's a couple of reasons. One, it uh, reduces your ability to turn on and off scans, um, which is really important. This is something that Greg and I meant to mention was that uh, uh, in your, uh, in your uh, managing uh, links, you want to be able to load and unload scans as you need them. Uh, that's the best way to reduce your memory cost on your computer and make things go faster, as opposed to having everything loaded all the time. Okay, fair enough. And I'm trying to and think if there's any other big drawbacks. Yeah, Greg, did you want to jump in on that one? Did you, did you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, with, with the latest features of Revit, uh, when you're linking in the point five files, uh, absolutely put it on a work set, keep it uh, unloaded by default so that when you start ending up with additional modelers on the project that they don't uh, open up the point cloud every time that they open up Revit. Uh, it just makes for a healthier, easier workflow so you don't have to load that data in. Okay, good. And uh, Kevin, this one's for you. Is there a way to isolate elements and the, and the pipe clouds used to extract the pipe in Edgewise? I'm not sure I fully understand that. Can you can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. I think maybe this should read: Is there a way to isolate elements in the pipe cloud, the point clouds, used to extract the pipe in Edgewise? Does that make sense? L let me take a crack at it. I'll I'll okay. take my best shot. Um, sure. The you can isolate the points associated with a particular section of pipe. So if you if if you've got a pipe run, um, you can you can isolate all the points around that. Um, you can delete them from the point cloud, um, or you can analyze just those points. Um, so uh, I I I think <laughs> is is okay. is the answer. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. And uh, I think we're going to make this next question the last one, and and I'll throw this out for either uh, Greg or Larry. Uh, Greg, you can take a first shot at this one. Do you ever run into an issue with scanned objects being difficult to model in Revit because scanned objects are not parallel, perpendicular, etc.? And uh, they also ask basically the difference between the real world and the design world. How do you deal with this issue? Good question. Uh, yeah, that's certainly a crux. Um, everything is uh, in the human world based upon interpretation. And so I had mentioned before that you know, using the algorithms, you can at least get some predictable items. Those custom objects in Revit, um, Larry and I were talking about this a bit yesterday, but they, they quite often end up being in-place families. Um, if it's a typical, let's say, a wall or a pipe, it's basically up to your interpretation of that object and using the tool. 
so there's there's always that fudge factor. Um, what happens is you have, you typically end up with highly accurate scan data, and then what you want to do is set the expectation to the client that the deliverable is going to be a slightly lower accuracy because because it is subject to that interpretation. Um, a great example, you know, for me being a, a huge structural background, is a steel beam. Maybe that steel beam has a little bit of a deflection in it. If that deflection is, you know, an inch over 40 feet, you're probably not going to model that as a deliverable unless that was specifically something that the client wanted to look at. Um, in which case, you would have to build some kind of a mesh of that particular object uh, as an in-place family, or you work through AutoCAD or something to that effect. So there's there's a lot of those situations for custom objects uh, inside of Revit. Sure. Okay. And Larry, do you have anything to add in on that one? Larry? Larry, I think you need to unmute yourself. All right. Well, we may have lost Larry on that one. And uh, so we'll, we'll just move along. Really, it's time for us to wrap up. Um, and so, of course, what I want to do is uh, thank everybody um, on behalf of our panelists and our sponsors. Uh, that's Workflow 4.0 and ClearEdge 3D. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And just a quick reminder, you'll be receiving an email after the broadcast with a link to the recording. And uh, you'll have a chance to subscribe to the newsletter. And there will be other follow-up information as well. And we hope to see you again for our next webinar in the near future. Thanks for joining us.